thank you all this afternoon for being here. My, my remarks today are going to begin with a slight detour over what some may regard as bumpy ground. So to coin a phrase in vogue here at the moment, I recommend you fasten your seatbelts. I normally like to open with a couple of platitudes, just to break the ice. You know the kind of thing, bland, anodyne stuff, like how nice it is to be amongst friends who make you feel so welcome. But that was before I read the recent PwC release about today's event. This contained the results of a survey which said regulation topped the list of concerns in Bermuda's insurance industry. One respondent was quoted as describing regulation as a huge and expensive problem, which is strangling the industry's ability to operate effectively across jurisdictions. And the release claimed this concern was expressed more often in Bermuda than elsewhere. So now I know who my friends are, or should I say are not, which means no platitudes today for you. To, for you. Instead, I have no choice but to begin by launching a full-on defense of the realm. I am joking, guys. You're, you've just had lunch. We, we, we need a little bit of levity here. While I wouldn't want to turn the seatbelt sign off just yet, it's fair to say that opinion surveys do tend to come with a health warning. They reflect perceptions rather than reality. And don't forget that different surveys conducted by different pollsters on the same subject have been known to produce entirely different results. Despite that, I think it would be unwise to discount these findings completely. If they reflect a perception that's out there, I need to take it on board. But let me put some of this in context for you. Not surprisingly, at the heart of these concerns is a fear of the unknown. In other words, uncertainty over what's around the corner. What nasty regulatory shocks are in store. Even a regulator can understand why that poses a challenge. But in this respect, perhaps more so than in any other, insurance supervision in Bermuda is an exemplary example of transparent collaboration. Over the years, we've developed an enabling consultative culture. This empowers both the regulator and the regulated. It underpins our dialogue and has nurtured a strong working relationship with the financial service industry. This relationship, in my view, is one of the ways we differentiate ourselves from our other insurance jurisdictions around the world. Bottom line, we're not in the business of delivering surprises. On the contrary, our annual business plan, our consultation papers, our market updates, and regular interaction with the industry create an ideal forum in which we can exchange information and gauge market sentiment. Another criticism that came out of the release concerned the cost as well as the volume of supervisory change. But I'd have to say that like everything else, the regulatory environment does carry a price. And like everything else, prices tend to rise over time, especially when driven by increases in demand. Also, if we were in Europe or the US, the cost of insurance regulation would not be particularly remarkable. But life in a regulatory microchasm like ours is different. Here, everything draws attention. Everything is subjected to various levels of public scrutiny and debate, from the price of eggs to the cost of insurance supervision. That's just the way it is and I offer no excuse. However, in an environment as transparent as ours, levels of concern
tend to be me more easily heightened on just about every front. And yes, maybe that's not such a bad thing. But more significantly, we have to ask the question, what does Bermuda's supervisory system do for its financial services industry that it can't do for itself? I'll answer that question in a moment. As you're probably aware, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the formation of the Bermuda Monetary Authority. While the authority's specific responsibility for the insurance sector dates from Jan 1, 2002, regulators have been supervising the Bermuda market for more than 40 years, starting with captive insurance in the 70s and 80s and moving through successive phases of growth. The Bermuda insurance and reinsurance market at December 31st, 2018 comprised 1,198 registered license holders with gross premiums of $150.4 billion on a combined capital and surplus base of $269.4 billion. Excuse me, I'm going to take off my jacket. It's a bit warm in here. And the numbers continue to grow. Last year, a total of 79 new insurance entities were added to the Bermuda Register. Of these, 38% were special purpose insurers. I'll talk a bit more about them in a moment. While general business captives accounted for 24% of the new registrants. I won't detail the many twists and turns we've experienced on the road to becoming what many regard as the risk capital of the world, but I will provide some milestone highlights which will give you a sense of how we're supervising a market that AM Best contains, says contains more than 20% of the world's top 50 reinsurers as measured by gross premiums written. In the 90s, as our commercial insurance market began to flourish, we introduced the concept of risk-weighted insurance licensing and risk-based supervision. That in itself was quite a shift for a regulatory regime that until then had been primarily focused on the supervision of captives. Sidecars were soon added to the commercial underwriting scene as the industry felt the impact of a string of natural catastrophes. Catastrophe business remains one of the biggest sectors of our market, and we keep a close watch on its progress. According to ABEAR, the Association of Bermuda Insurers and Reinsurers, Bermuda is the largest supplier of catastrophe reinsurance to U.S. insurers paying out over 200 billion in claims to U.S. policyholders in the past decade, including 30% of claims arising from Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria in 2017. As part of our stress testing and CAT modeling practice review, we assess our insurer's ability to absorb CAT risk events. Our most recent CAT underwriting stress test results demonstrated that the Bermuda market has significant financial strength, enough to withstand the impact of potential large losses and still have capital remaining to settle policyholder obligations. No review of the Bermuda market would be complete without a reference to the special purpose insurers and insurance-linked securities. At December 31 last year, we had 140 special purpose insurers on our register. According to research published last month by Moody's Investor Service, more than more insurance and reinsurance sedents expect to increase their use of alternative capital than reduce it. Moody's says collateralized reinsurance remains the preferred form of alternative capital, followed by insurance-linked securities and cap bonds. In 2017, the Bermuda Monetary Authority introduced an enhanced reporting requirement for reinsurers 
with alternative capital structures to facilitate collection of key data, such as structure of the insurer and summary of contract details. The BMA introduced the alternative capital schedule. We felt this enhancement to be essential to maintaining an effective supervisory regime for this rapidly growing sector. At the end of 2017, Bermuda's share of total alternative cap capacity had risen to 51.9 billion, or approximately 58% of the global alternative capital market. Keeping up with an innovative industry is a challenge, but I think we've done a good job not only of responding to change, but anticipating it. We focused especially on opportunities to promote efficiency and enhance effectiveness and competitiveness in our market. To this end, the authority recently launched two parallel innovation tracks. I think you've heard of these, the Insurance Regulatory Sandbox and an Innovation Hub, both initially targeted at insurance technology or insure tech companies. The Regulatory Sandbox is an innovation track for companies looking to test new technologies or business models to a limited number of clients in a controlled environment and for a limited period of time. The experience we gained from the Sandbox and the Innovation Hub served as a useful guide for the BMA in drafting rules for the introduction of two new classes of insurers in 2019 the insurance marketplace providers, and class 2i GB insurers. Essentially our intermediate license, intermediary license, an insurance marketplace provider would operate a platform of any type established for the purpose of buying, selling, or trading contracts of insurance. Our class 2IGB insurers, which stands for Innovative Insurer General Business, are companies that intend to carry on general business in an innovative manner. The class would include those entities that plan to adopt the full use of digital assets or tokenized, a tokenized business model. Driving some of these initiatives at the BMA is a newly formed multidisciplinary team of actuaries, computer scientists, and data analysts and engineers working in our Department of Insurance Supervision. The regulatory sandbox, innovation training, and ways to harness artificial intelligence are among the team's responsibilities. Additionally, it's charged with monitoring the capital impact of devout, devalued assets on a company's financial strength. This could include carbon exposed assets, for example, or possible fallout from swings in financial markets, which could affect capital ratios. I hope I've given you a sense of how the marketplace is evolving and a level of understanding of some of the challenges we're facing. One challenge I haven't mentioned, partly because it's common to all employers in the risk industry, is the increasingly difficult task of hiring and retaining people with the skill sets we require. This is a moving target, which is getting harder to hit. The skills we're looking for today in our new hires are not the same as the, few, the skills that we were looking for a few years ago. For example, we're making greater use of artificial intelligence at the BMA. We now rely on machine learning to help the authority gauge the health of companies and assess their risk profiles based on operational history. AI also helps us to integrate data or interrogate data that we're scraping from company websites and is now used to perform risk classifications on all insurers and reinsurers in Bermuda. Cyber is another moving target for us, extending the range of ex external supervision as well as our internal activities. 
On the one hand, we regard cyber as a key enterprise risk affecting reinsurers regulated by the BMA, along with data privacy and information security. With the expansion of the global cyber reinsurance market, the BMA asked insurers, commercial insurers, to provide cyber underwriting data in their 2017 year-end capital insolvency return. According to that data captured in these filings, 37 commercial insurers and 15 groups are writing affirmative cyber insurance. This information request has been extended in the 2018 filings to include all financial services sector entities. Many companies are now working to assess aggregate exposures to cyber, especially across all risk policies and liability that they haven't specifically, that have not specifically excluded cyber risk. Future filings will include a request for insurers to include those own, their own silent cyber, this is the cyber that people aren't sure about, their own cy silent cyber stress test information. Part of the BMA response to cyber is to ensure its supervisors are professionally trained and certified in cyber audits. A total of seven members of our development and predictive analytics team have completed and passed the cyber audit training program run by the Information Systems Audit and Control Association in the US. These cyber specialists conduct on-site assessments and produce cyber risk ratings while also engaging in other aspects of insurance supervision. The BMA expects to roll out best, our, our base standards for cyber supervision over the course of the next 18 months. But it's not just a matter of finding people with the right skill sets. We're also looking for talent that will be a good cultural fit for us. And that has as much to do with how you think rather than purely what you know. All as insurance regulators, we're required to demonstrate that we understand the risk in each of the sectors we supervise, and that we execute this responsibility to a standard that allows the buyers of insurance from Bermuda registrants to feel confident that their interests are being protected. Given the extensive publicity generated at the time, I'd be remiss if I did not mention economic substance requirements. These were applied to Bermuda this year by the EU and the OECD. You may recall that Bermuda's economic substance legislation, which came into force at the beginning of the year, required, among other things, that core income generating activities, including those that are outsourced, must occur within the jurisdiction in order to comply with the act. For insurers, these activities are defined as the prediction and calculation of risk, the insuring and reinsuring of risk, client services, and regulatory reporting. Bermuda's commercial insurers and reinsurers will generally not have a problem meeting these requirements. But unfortunately, some captive insurers may need to make adjustments to the way they operate. Interpretation of economic substance provisions by the government's registrar of companies and determining what constitutes core income generating activities will be key to the process. For example, it could be argued that only board and senior management decisions related to core income generating activities need to be carried out in Bermuda. Remains to be seen how this will play out. Obviously, a strict interpretation could drive up cost in the Bermuda captive industry and make the island less attractive, a less attractive domicile for this business. However, to date, the indications give us cause for optimism that this will not happen.
In fact, I'll go one step further. We will make sure this does not happen. Looking to the future, and on a more positive note, I'm happy to report, following our meeting with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners in August of this year, and completion of our subsequent submission, Bermuda is soon likely to be given reciprocal jurisdiction status under Section 9 of the NAIC's Credit for Reinsurance Model Regulation. Essentially, what that means is that our commercial insurers complying with specified criteria will eventually no longer have to meet partial collateral requirements under the NAIC's qualified jurisdiction rules in order for CEDAs in the U.S. to receive credit for reinsurance. Obviously, though partial collateral relaxation under the qualified jurisdiction rules was beneficial, complete removal of collateral in what is still Bermuda's largest market will give our commercial insurers and reinsurers even more of a competitive advantage over those from jurisdictions that have not achieved this status. I believe the three jurisdictions that the NAIC are reviewing are Bermuda, Switzerland, and Japan. I understand we're likely to receive this sometime during the end of this year. Ladies and gentlemen, based on the issues I've addressed today, you could be forgiven for concluding that the BMA is a largely passive regulator, focused exclusively on bringing its supervisory regime into line with the international regulatory community's rulebook. But the truth is that we are complete pragmatists. Our focus is on contributing to what we believe will be for the greater good of Bermuda. Our prime objective is and has always been the development of a world-class, respected, independent regulator of Bermuda's financial services industry. We need to remember that our reputation as a financial center depends not only on the activities of the private sector, but also on our ability to continue executing and consistently delivering supervision to the high standard expected of us. I posed a question a little while ago. I asked what Bermuda's supervisory system can do for its financial services industry that it can't do for itself. The answer is that the provision of an independent but critical public-private platform built on a partnership between the regulator and the regulated not so long ago, partnership in this context was considered a dirty word. It was viewed and generally discounted at the time as marketing speak. Insurance regulators had to be careful how they used that word, if they even used it at all. But today, I stand before you and say that I have no hesitation in saying that the partnership between Bermuda's insurance industry and its regulator is what helped us achieve Solvency II equivalents and will secure, certainly, and help us secure this reciprocal jurisdiction status with the NAIC. I believe, as I said earlier, that it's a key differentiator for us. So rather than strangling the industry, which is what was claimed in the survey results I referred to at the beginning of my talk, I would say that regulation is in fact providing it with the life-sustaining oxygen. Thank you.